Ms. Zimmerman, my parents are from Ethiopia. Did you know there are some villages there where there are not even enough gloves for people to go to the hospital and make sure that they don't get infections? I want to do something about that. What can I do? We have kids from 27 na nations in our school, and each one of them has a family history and a story. They have something to tell, something that they want to make an impact in their world. This one girl was really bothered by the idea that people from her, her family, her relatives, some people who are still there couldn't even get access to gloves. They would have to travel miles to a village to be able to even get help from a hospital, but they didn't have gloves. What does it mean to lean into consumerization for these kids? What does it mean when their lives can be changed by infection or not, or someone in their family? What does it mean to have access to technology or learning or understanding or wanting to make a difference in this world for change, not just for themselves, but for others? I have some background in working with Microsoft, and they've given the kids a chance to be able to talk about tools that can help them communicate their ideas and bring voice to the situations. So this next clip um, video is in the background, and it'll show some of the things that we talked with National Academy of Sciences just within this last month. Can you play the video, please? And they gave an opportunity for one of my students to come speak with some of the people in these different organizations and look at the ways that they've been able to share their voice with society. We know that a lot of research in science has been published in journals and empirical studies. And they were given an opportunity to co-author a chapter about digital ink and technology in the classroom. What does it mean for education in the future for them, where school may be absent? What do they imagine it'll be like? Will it be a place where they will still be able to collaborate? Will the school building look the same? What does it mean to have implicit learning, where you don't realize that you're learning, but there's some kind of impact or change in you? How can you make that learning explicit and change the way someone else thinks? We realize one of these ways is to be able to communicate ideas through media. And yes, YouTube is a perfect platform for this. We can exchange knowledge and get ideas. We can look at views. And through data and seeing how many views have taken place, we can find out if our ideas impacted society in a certain way. One of the girls who came with me to speak talked about how publishing happens in different ways now. It's not just through print sources. We have things like docs.com, we have things like YouTube that allow us to collect analytics and to be able to show these type of projects and how many views they've achieved. It's not just about getting attention, it's about getting the right kind of attention that can impact someone else's life. And before you get to that point, you need to practice these skills. So I have my students pitch concepts to their classmates to get ideas to see, does their idea make sense? Can they do something in a different way? And part of that criteria, critique, and feedback gives them a chance to say, are my ideas tested in a way that someone else can understand them? And if it's not, it's not about me being a bad person. It's about how can I make these ideas better? So she talked about the data and the Twitter activity when you tweet a video or something out. And if those ideas can spread, you know that something in the element of what you've done, what you've communicated and spoken can make a difference. And they've talked about how these can start bringing to um, ideas of different ways that they can push forward to make impact globally. This was from a project from the startup with a field trip experience to see a silent film. They created a concept pitch, a storyboard, to make their own silent film. It made it more challenging because they couldn't use words to speak and communicate their ideas. So through that process, they used OneNote, they came up with a concept of a title, they had criteria that they were supposed to meet what elements should be in this movie. But then along the way, they revised and drafted and then found out different pieces that helped them communicate the ideas that they wanted to create. They wrote a script, so that was English language arts. They had feedback and critique with um, digital ink that they used with other students and peers. And they wanted to come up with a resolution. As they go through these pitches, they start getting better at communicating their ideas. As they photograph and video and look through the different process, they start to see different things in feedback. It was challenging to do this at first because they would write out feedback and we'd have papers flying all over the place, but then we were able to use something that they were communicating their ideas to Microsoft and say, we want a different way of being able to communicate this and to be able to collect the data. So the team actually came from Beijing and helped redesign Microsoft Excel survey and change it into form so that it can be mobile. We see that mobile is really big now, and this gave them a chance to give immediate feedback, to see data and collected, um, to give back to their peers. So when we have this chance to give criteria and feedback, it puts the focus on assessment into their own hands instead of us as teachers saying, did you do well on this or did you not do well? 
As teachers, we know that change is constant. And that was perfect what Leilani said about the idea of leadership is essential. It's not just one teacher can do this and another can't, but it's a way of reorienting our thinking about how we approach education. Is it something that we're willing to go through constant change and say, what are we going to do today? Because when you do that, it threatens everything that you know as a teacher about the iconography of bundles and bouquets of sharpened pencils and multiple choice tests. Those give a sense of security. We have types of data that we're used to, but when there are new types of data and there are new ways of looking at things, it makes us question if what we've been doing is actually effective or not. And if that's part of our identity, then that questions who we are as people, and that can get uncomfortable unless we know what the end goal is. What do we want our students to be able to do? How do we want them to collaborate? What do we want them to do in industry or in business or their own family someday? This last June, I had the opportunity to go to the Disney Institute for Business Excellence, and it gave this beautiful framework about how to try and lead people when there's constant change. It was such a perfect model for education, even though it was meant for business. So I started looking at some of the concepts of virtual and augmented reality, some of the things that are made for consumers, not necessarily for education, and it started pushing my thinking, what can we start doing in the classroom or not in the classroom to help bring these ideas forward? Something that they're familiar with already, like cars. We can look at laminar and turbulent flow. What about car industries that are developing things? In Epcot, they have something called Test Track. And in Test Track, you have the ability to design things, and it's got a beautiful concept of STEM thinking. So there are so many pieces that already exist, and if we can pull them together in a way that pushes ideas forward, it gives us a chance to think about doing education differently with a combination of content that already exists and creation, with bringing kids' ideas into reality and going all the way from early childhood through high school and college. We can start partnering with corporations and help them to see that this foundation and pulling these concepts in for early ages will help them have better and more productive people that they're working with. This next background video gives an example of what it can look like with collaboration when kids lead the learning. The kids completely created this themselves from the beginning to the end with a script. The original goal was to say, create a structure of a redwood tree that has a root system and branches that extend to the full length of the tallest Gaudi person in the class. In and they were supposed to connect it with Gaudi's work and his architecture. His, his architecture was based a lot on nature and the structure that happened there where people said he's either a madman or a genius. We'd under, understand his architecture, why he does things the way that he does. But he changed the structure of the buildings. It wasn't the same way it had always been done before. So their goal was to research and figure out how all these different subject matters can connect with cultural studies, with architecture, with science, technology, engineering, arts and mathematics, and talk about how these pieces can fit together in a way that they can make sense of what they're building by hand was displayed in the Sagrada Familia, but nature as well. Although the Sagrada Familia and red red trees are contrasting topics, there are connections prevalent between both of them. Similar to the long trunks of red red trees, there are tall columns found in the church, and on its interior ceiling, structures are built in a way extremely similar to those of a redwood forest. We then apply these concepts from Gaudi's work into our own creation of a paper tree. In March of 2016, Renton Prep students initially started researching the Sagrada Familia, as well as various components related to it, including Spanish and math. Now in May, we have then stemmed off this research to create a new project revolved around the building of a paper and cardboard tree, inspired by Gaudi's love and incorporation of nature into his work. Additionally, we included themes from previous assignments, such as the use of recyclable materials from the Wally project, and concepts related to identity from the Seattle Art Museum Disguise Project. As the tallest type of tree on earth, redwood trees grow to typically be about 300 to 350 feet tall, or at the most 300 As I've been looking around at different schools across the United States and across the world, I just got a chance to interact with and visit three different schools in the Netherlands. I found out some of the same challenges that we're having in the United States are the same that, that are happening across schools globally. It goes around with curriculum. It happens to do, it has to do with leadership and has to do with teacher training and preparation. 
I used to think it was just site specific with our school. Maybe this is just a challenge with trying to help educators move past some of the things that were done traditionally. And even more, I realized that when you move forward and try to do things in a different way, there's going to be kickback. And with a number of people in this room, I'm sure there have been a huge number of you who have experienced some form of kickback, whether it's from other people in your organization or people who don't want the ideas being challenged. And I want to encourage you to keep going because there are days where it feels like you can't go any farther, where it would be just easier to just give up on the innovation and go for a way that's more traditional, steady, calm, and easy. But then you look at the kids and you see what's possible in their lives, the kids who don't feel like they have hope in another way, or the kids who don't have support from their families, or the ones who wonder if anything in their voice can make a difference. And they're worth the fight. They're worth persisting. They're worth giving it another chance. They're worth saying, even though this is difficult for me to get out of bed this morning, or even though I don't know if I'm making any difference, you are. Don't give up hope on this. And I've seen throughout the time that I've talked across the United States, especially within this last year, that some of the most innovative organizations, people, educators, administrators, have been the ones who have been attacked the most. It's something people don't typically talk about because they feel like if I say this, maybe someone will think I did something wrong. But what I found out from each one of these people is that they've done incredibly amazing things. They have a type of humility and a passion that keeps them going, but still stay silent in some of these areas. I want each of you here to make a difference in each other's lives by speaking out on some of those things and supporting and encouraging each other. You don't have to stay silent on those areas. Especially where innovation happens, you need to band together as brothers and sisters in this type of education change. When you look at the kids working together, they have to get past some of the challenges of communication. They all have very different backgrounds and their tree fell down. They were so excited about their first design and when they saw it collapse the next morning, they're going, oh, what do we do? And the other one says, we can't give up yet. We just changed the root structure. What's your root structure in your company, in your school, in your organization? How can you make it stronger? How can you rebuild when it feels like things have collapsed? When something that seems as flimsy as a piece of paper can come together, maybe it doesn't look beautiful at first, but there's a feeling of success because there's change that's happened, they learned something through the process, and each one of those elements represented something about them. They cut apart the Skype poster to show the differences of who they are from different parts of the world and how they came together that there can be something structurally sound and secure. They brought in different colors, they brought in origami, they brought in something about identity of who they are to represent this larger project. Even though it was a paper tree in the middle of a room that was a very different environment, didn't look like a traditional classroom, it meant something to them. For the parents who walked in and saw it later, they go, oh, oh great, there's a little paper cardboard tree. But for me and for the other teachers, we saw what it meant to them. What change are you bringing in the lives of students? How are you making that change? And who do you want these children to become? What difference can they make in their future children's lives, in their societies, in their countries, in their world? And how are you making that ability for their voice and for their change to be heard? Thank you for all of the work that you're doing and for everything you're doing to push forward education. As an educator, I know that this is making a difference. Even on the days where it feels like you can't go anymore, you can. Thank you.